and I want to start this morning by asking you a question for you to ponder, and the question is, what makes a great church? What makes a great church? What makes this church a great church? And you might say, or be tempted to say, well, it's the preaching that makes a great church, and you know, when people come and they feel maybe inspired and they go away and they've learned a little bit and they're happy when they get home and uh, maybe it's the preaching, it's the message. And, uh, and the problem with that, I think, is that sometimes if that's the primary thing, then it just sort of becomes a one-person show. And, um, and I don't think that's what God had in mind. Uh, or you might say, well, what makes a great church are the great pastors might be good you know it's uh, when you have uh, people on staff that make you feel cared for and loved and and accepted and you know and then everybody's grateful for the paid professionals that get paid to care for you that was kind of a pun a little bit a little bit of a joke but um, but I don't think that's the key to a great church really either or you could say the programs you know it's all the programs if a church has enough programs, you know, and it appeals to a broad enough base and, you know, somebody, you know, there'll be something for everybody and, and it's got to be the programs and, and, you know, but I don't think that's the real key to a great church either. Maybe it's the facilities. You know, people come here and <clears throat> they, they'll want to see our, uh, our campus. We had some friends here from Hong Kong uh, earlier and um, you know not too long ago and you know they wanted to see the place and so we took them uh, and showed them the whole place you know started with the office the activity center the kitchen you know if you've been around a church long enough and you, anyway we looked at the kitchen they were impressed and you know the worship center they thought wow this is a nice place and then took them to the cafe and the children's facility and you know everybody's response is wow you know, this is a nice place. Uh, this has got to be a great church. Um, but I really want to say to them when I take people on a tour that the facilities really don't compare really with what the greatness of this church is. And the facilities don't really measure up with the people of this church and I wish you could see them that's what I wish you could see not hear the preaching or see the preachers or look at the facility or experience a program but it's the people and we have people here I think who get it you just heard from one one of several people who get it who believe in Jesus and that means because they believe in Jesus they get out of their comfort zone. They go out beyond themselves to care for people because one of the things we know is that Jesus cares about us and part of the call is we care for each other. We care for others. And we want to make life better for others because we know what Jesus came to do. He came to care for the least, the last, and the lost. Jesus came to care for the marginalized and the disenfranchised. That's why we're here today, is to experience and to live like Jesus lived, to do what Jesus calls, to do, calls us to do in the name of Jesus, to love people, to love people that he loved the way that he loved them and to care about them in the way that Jesus cares. We have great people and great leaders at New Covenant. And those people create great ministries. You know, that's one of the things I like about this place. Is people experience Jesus and they feel empowered and they get involved and they make things happen. That's why this is a great church. In this series we started last week, Simply Important, we're looking at those basic but critical commitments that we make as members of the church, but also as followers of Jesus. And when you come and join this church, we ask you when you join, 
will you make a commitment to Christ through the church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Those five things. And this morning, we're looking at the second of those, and that's presence. What does that mean? That means you're making a commitment to be present to God and to each other. Now, what I hope you'll do and what I encourage you to do at each one of these kinds of things where we're making commitments is that what you'll do, you know, kind of theoretically or in some, you know, way is to turn and look back over the last 12 months of your life and see where you've been and then turn and look at the 12 months that are coming up or the next year and say, you know, I've done this, but I feel like I need to set a goal that pushes me for next year so that at the end of next year when I look back like I'm doing now, that I have grown, that I'm closer to Jesus, that I will have grown in my faith. When new people come or a new believer comes and they talk to me and they say, you know, ask me the question, what should I do to grow in my faith? I could, I could talk to them about a hundred different things that are important, but I think what the advice I usually give is this. Find a place where God is at work and spend some time there. We've been studying the book of Acts on Wednesday evening. Um, we've been looking at the things that God is doing there and continues to do, the revival that broke out. And one of the things you observe is that when you find a place where God is working and you spend some time there, inadvertently, you might not be there because you're wanting to look at what God is doing uh, necessarily, but if you're there, guess what's going to happen to you? If God pours his spirit out and revival breaks out, you're gonna, it's going to spill onto you, right? It's, you're going to get some of it. So one of the great things we can do is find where God is working and spend some time there because you might in your own life encounter God in a new way that makes a difference for you. I encourage you to get involved with a small group of people that are Christ-centered and who have an objective of making a difference in the world and spend some time with them. Because my belief is, is that if you will get with that small group who are Christ-centered and who are, who are wanting to make a difference in the world, if you spend some time there at the end of the year, it's, sort of, it's not magic, but just I know what's going to happen at the end of the year as you look back on your life, some of that will have rubbed off on you and the desires of your heart will have changed. We had a great staff meeting this last week. We were evaluating last week's worship service and the focus on prayer, and people started opening up. And I, I just felt like it was a remarkable time of honesty and transparency. And I, and I felt God's presence at staff meeting. As we talked about God's presence last Sunday in worship, and we started hearing some amazing stories about God showing up here. I really believe this, is that you being here will help you. And you may not always be aware of it. You may come and say, well, we sang that song a couple weeks ago. He preached that sermon like, last year I'm talking about Jay um, is he here to defend himself yeah there he is yeah. Um, but inadvertently what will happen is because God is faithful and some of that's going to rub off on you in your life and so what I want to encourage you to do is up your game it's always interesting to me <clears throat> that sometimes what happens on a weekend, like a Saturday afternoon football game 
or a time change where you can get an extra hour? Is it affects where, whether people show up in worship? How does that work? You know, why is that so? Um, I want to encourage you to be present to what God is doing here. We all know there's a difference between being somewhere and being present there, don't we? You used to could walk into a restaurant uh, here in Edmond, let's say, and there'd be a family of four and the food would come and their, head would, would, their heads would bow and they would pray. And now you walk into a restaurant and everybody around the table, their heads are bowed, but one of the things you realize is they're all looking at their cell phones and they're looking, checking Facebook or Instagram or uh, answering a uh, text and, and they're not present at all. They're in the same place, but they're not present with each other, right? What I'm talking about is being present. Do you know how relationships are created? You know how friendships are formed? How life gets good for people? Here's the way that happens. It's usually being present to each other in small ways. Being present with each other in small ways. You go to a, a team meeting and you tell one of the members of your team, say, you know, I heard your dad is not doing well. And they said, yeah, they don't think he's going to make it. And you say to that person, you know, you want to grab a cup of coffee after the meeting and let's just talk about that? And then you go grab that cup of coffee and you say, you know, well, let me pray with you. Or, I mean, did you hear what Shonda said in her testimony? Go on, the triangle crumbled and she and Marcus are going through all of this stuff and she comes to a Bible study with these women that are over 60, older than she is. And they're studying God's Word, doing important stuff, right? But did you hear what she said that made the difference? Did you catch it? A hug. A hug. I forgot how important a hug was. I hadn't been hugged in a year. A hug. How difficult is that? A hug. Everybody stand up that can. And I know this is, gets you introverts a little, makes you uncomfortable. But I want you to hug somebody. Just go ahead and hug them right now. Okay, some of you are getting a little too carried away. Some of you got more than one. How complicated is that? How technical is that? How difficult is that to give somebody a hug or shake somebody's hand? And what a difference it makes. So the first place I would ask, first thing I would ask you to do is be present to God and each other, be present in worship. Worship is not a spectator sport. Listen, worship is not something we watch. Worship is not something we observe. Let me tell you a secret. Listen, worship is not even something we attend. Worship is something that we do in response to what God has done for us. It's an active participation. Real worship is our giving all of ourselves to all of God that we understand. Worship is something we do. Now, some of you may be here and you're thinking, I don't know about this Jesus deal. I don't know about church. I want you to know it's okay because I believe that New Covenant is a safe place. You can be hugged. We're not going to put a lot of pressure on you. It's a safe place. But let me tell you, let me tell you something else. 
you don't have to believe like we believe. You don't have to do what we do. We lo- here's, here's the deal. We love you. Why? Because Jesus loved you. Because Jesus accepts us like we are and loves us beyond that. We love you because you're a human being. And in this wonderful, terrible thing we call life, we discover that life works a whole lot better when we're kind to each other and when we take care of each other, when we, when we try to love each other. And sometimes it's as simple as a hug. So if you're a committed follower of Jesus, I want to encourage you to engage, to be present in worship, and you say, well, I can't sing. That's okay. Bev's dad couldn't sing. I mean, he was an awful singer, but you'd stand by him in church, and he would sing at the top of his voice. And, you know, I learned his testimony. He's a rough south side Chicago kid, grew up in Chicago, went to Minnesota, and God saved him. And he knew what God had done in his life. And he was singing not because he sounded good, but because he was thankful for what Jesus had done in his life. And if you can't sing and you're uncomfortable, tap your foot. If that bothers the person in front of you, you know, just... uh, in your spirit, just pray and give thanks to God as we worship. Do whatever connects you to God. Praise God. Be thankful. Thank Jesus for what he's done in you. The second thing I would say, these last two things, I'm going to go quickly. I want to encourage you to be present in discipleship. I know. I mean, discipleship, I know, is a churchy word. Um... And it may cause some of you some consternation, but it simply means this. It simply means to be a follower. When a rabbi would choose some disciples, is what the disciples would do, that word simply means follower, and the rabbi would be walking along and the disciples would be following the rabbi, and they weren't necessarily trying to learn what the rabbi knew. They were trying to live the way the rabbi lived. It wasn't just head stuff. They were trying to learn how to live life and engage in the activities that made them like the rabbi. Discipleship is trying to live and engage in activities and being present to God in a way that makes us like the rabbi, Jesus, so that we are Jesus' presence in the world. The real goal is not to learn what the rabbi knew, but the goal is to live the way the rabbi lived. People are changing here. You may not be aware of it. Lives are being transformed here. Marriages and families are getting better here because people are connecting with Christ in ways make their lives better and we've got all kinds of activities we even have a catalog you can choose activities that will help you just try one the third thing that I encourage you to do is to be present with others when you're here everybody carries something right Everybody carries a burden, an insecurity, a worry. Everybody carries a fear they can't get over, a failure that makes them feel ashamed, some guilt that they can't evade. Everybody carries some loss they can't get over or a hurt that seems as though it can't get healed. Some suffer from broken relationships that can't be made right. what they need, what we need, whether we're aware of it or not, is we need people who are willing to be present with us. I don't mean poke and pry around. I mean people that are present with us that can see us, 
and care for us and that say, I'm here for you. Esquire magazine had this article about the 50 well-known men and they asked the question, what made you who you are? And some of them were actors, politicians, business leaders, athletes. One of them was Tyler Perry, whom many of you will recognize the name. Uh, he may be familiar to most of you. He's written 38 films and television shows, directed 39, acted in 33. And he's done okay. He's worth about $400 million. He identifies himself as a Christian, and theological themes run through all of his writings and his plays and movies. He grew up in a poor family in New Orleans. His father beat him as a child and adolescent. He was abused by family friends, molested. At one point, in order to try to cope with what was going on, the brokenness in his life, he attempted suicide to escape the beatings from his dad. He went from that to who he is now. And the question is, how did that happen? Who helped him? He wrote this in that article. Listen to what he said. My next-door neighbor, very early on, Mr. Johnson, was the kindest, most gentle man I ever met, and he was the first person to actually see me. Not even in my own house did I exist. But when he looked at me, he let me know that I was alive and that I had a voice. I see you. You matter. I care about you. You are not alone. People ask me, what's the hardest part of your job? I bet it's when you have to go to a family that's lost a loved one, and that's hard. And as a young pastor, I used to think, well, I have, I have to have all the right words, and I have to be able to, to give those, you know, ma magic words. And I'd pray at church, Lord, give me the right words, and get in the car, Lord, give me the right words, and knock on the door, Lord, give me the right words, and go into the house, and you'd pray, Lord, give me the right words. I was naive, but my heart was right. <clears throat> As I've gotten older, I've learned a few things. And one of the things I've learned is this. My words cannot heal people. Only Jesus can heal people. I've learned that no matter how brilliant my answers, they cannot make broken, wounded people whole. But I've learned something else. That when you walk through that door in a darkened room with a family that's broken hearted, that one of the greatest things you bring is a presence, is being there to cry with them, to wonder with them, to struggle with them, to let them ask questions, to let them be angry at God and you and the church, and to weep as they weep to be present with them in such a way that they, and this is the most amazing thing, and I didn't know this always, is that just being present is that God would show up and they would feel the presence of God in your presence. You matter. You being here matters told a story, and I'm going to close with this. We're going to invite those that, who are serving communion to come and start making preparation. And as they come, let me just tell you this story. We just had a memorial service for Belva Rich. And the day of a memorial service, Ricky, uh, her son-in-law, Debbie's husband, said, I wish somebody would have told the story about their church experience. And I said, Ricky, I don't know that I knew that story. What is it? Uh, Julie had made reference to it in the eulogy and Ricky said when Dale and Belva were in a church up in Kansas their son committed suicide and when their son committed suicide the church abandoned them or at least they felt abandoned by the church and they quit they quit going to church they, they relocated he took a job down in Texas and they didn't go to church and when he retired, they started coming to church here at New Covenant. And New Covenant embraced them. They started coming. And Christ embraced them through this church. And 
Dale and Belva have been so faithful to Jesus because they reconnected with Jesus through here, through you. And I could go on with a lot of stories. But Jesus is here in our presence and here for us and to be present with us. And he's here for you.